This is Jeffrey Sachs, editor of Tradition. You're listening to an installment of an engaging series of conversations about issues facing modern Orthodox Judaism around the world. Your host for these conversations is Rabbi Alon Meltzer of Congregation Or Chadash in Sydney, Australia, talking with authors from Tradition's recent Rabbi Norman Lamb Memorial Volume. Visit traditiononline.org to order that volume, sample open access chapters, or subscribe to our Journal of Orthodox Jewish Thought. This series is produced by Or Chadash in cooperation with Tradition. Our thanks to Rabbi Meltzer for his leadership on this initiative. Here's the conversation. Um, writings of Rabbi Dr. Norman Lamb. Mm-hmm. Um, we are extremely excited and privileged to have the incredible Dr. Erica Brown joining us uh, in her Motzei Shabbat. Um, and we want to try and mute. Oh, great. Um, joining, on, joining, joining us on her Motzei Shabbat, um, and we thank you for giving us your time. Uh, Dr. Brown is the Vice Provost for Values and Leadership at Yeshiva University. She's the founding director of the Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs Hernstein Center for uh, Values and, um, and Leadership. She is Traditions Consulting Editor. She's a uh, longtime contributor, uh, editorial board member. She is one of the most inspiring and incredible um, writers, thinkers, thought leaders of our generation. Um, and the Jewish people is so lucky to have her um, She's a frequent, uh, frequent um, uh, scholar that pops up in, in my in my drashes and shiurim, um, and to have the opportunity to hear from you live is really an incredible opportunity. With that, I'm just going to pass straight over to you, um, and everyone enjoy today's shiur. Thank you. I will wish you a shavua tov. This, by the way, is a testament to, testament to Alon's charm and tenacity because. This is usually the hour I'm already in bed, um, but uh, uh, I have an Australian daughter-in-law and uh, love her very much. And uh, and and actually, was supposed to come uh, because of COVID. We weren't able to come in June of 2020 to visit Australia and learn with all of you. So I took this um, I took this opportunity. It's also an, uh, important for me as an editor of Tradition and as a student, uh, a former student of Rabbi Lamb, and a deep, deep admirer of his work, of his teaching, of his sermons to be able to pay tribute to him uh, this evening. I'm uh, delighted to say that his grandson, Rabbi Ari Lam, who is a close friend, uh, had a baby boy after three girls uh, about um, a little over a month ago, and he is the new Norman Lamb. So there is actually a small Norman Lamb. I asked if he was born with a goatee, and the answer is no. Um, (laughs) So... What I wanted to look at with you, uh, the way that, uh, I I don't know, did Jeffrey Sachs, how long did Jeffrey Sachs um, speak for this series? Yes, he does. So um, uh, Jeff and I have known each other for about 40 years, uh, uh, close friends, and when we went over Tradition wanted to honor Rabbi Lamb, who was one of Tradition's longtime editors and certainly did a great deal to put Tradition onto the map as a journal of Jewish, uh, of Jewish thought. Uh, when we were talking about how we wanted to divide it, Jeff had a brilliant idea, which was that each of us would take a work that was significant and sort of talk about its uh, impact in the world and also in uh, specifically its impact on a more personal level. Some essays were a little bit more personal. Ari Goldman and I spoke because both of us talked uh, more about the relationship that we had with uh, Rabbi Lamb. Um, Ari Goldman is uh, is his nephew, is his nephew. And so he had a particularly important relationship. And I think um, I think give, uh, Ari Goldman as a, as a former New York Times journalist was very influenced by the elegance of Rabbi Dr. Lamb's writing and speaking. He was a frequent visitor to the Jewish Center, which was uh, Rabbi Lamb's pulpit. And I served as a community scholar there for three years. And I had the great privilege, not only of having him as a teacher when I was an undergraduate at Yeshiva University, and he did a small seminar on Hasidic thought for a group of students. But I was able to listen to him, uh, give his sermons, and also give sermons in his shul in his presence in his later years. And uh, I'm a student of his sermons. 
And that's a little bit unusual because most people are students of people's books, their teachings. Um, they're not necessarily students of a sermon. And yet uh, we now have the gift at Yeshiva University of the Rabbi Lamb archives. And one of the most beautiful experiences as a writer myself is looking at Rabbi Lamb's sermons when they were typed. And all of the notes, the marginalia, the corrections, he was very fastidious in the way that a word landed. Um, I have uh, spoken with two people who served as rabbis uh, under Rabbi Lamb, and Rabbi Lamb would often go over before and also debrief after the sermon. He would talk about it. Um, really, the sermon was a work of art for him. And he thought a lot about the text, the construction, the message. Rabbi Lamb did not back down from saying, um, saying controversial things. Um, uh, matters uh, or matters of conviction were very important to him. Uh, Jewish education was very important to him. Synagogue attendance was important to him. And he didn't shy from giving those important messages uh, very directly, but elegantly and beautifully. And it, it, so it wasn't only that he chose this language very carefully, but that he um, that he worked with others, uh, younger colleagues, in making sure that they understood the importance of a sermon. And I say that because for the volume on Rabbi Lamb, I chose to talk about the emotional range of his sermons and why I think that the sermon is the most perfect expression of Torah Umada. Uh, you know, when you go to a university and the motto is Torah Umada, uh, you, you believe that the university education is the foundational experience of Torah Umada, is the capacity to study Talmud, Tanakh, other study, other, other aspects of, uh, of, of Jewish textual learning, Jewish history, Hebrew language, but also studying literature, science, and, 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 um, and, uh, and the, the realm of humanities. I was a philosopher, I was a student of philosophy. That was my, my area of study and integrating these, integrating these worlds. And yet perhaps the most significant impact of the Torah Umada personality is crafted by the ongoing listening experience of hearing a sermon where, a current, where current events are integrated with the Jewish text and a message to the congregation, sometimes a message um, that's relevant for a particular occasion, whether that's a wedding or a bar mitzvah. So that capacity to be an amazing reader and an amazing weaver, I think was, uh, was an arena in which Rabbi Lang Lamb had particular distinction. And one of the things that I wanna share with you um, about uh, listening to Rabbi Lamb is that I'll often hear rabbis, uh, I have the privilege of speaking in many synagogues, and you know, there's that joke that you say, how long did it take you to prepare this sermon? And the rabbi will say, well, it really, it depends on my walk to shul. And it was, you know, if I have a 15 minute walk to shul, that's what I'm sort of putting together my sermon. And what I think Rabbi, rabbi Lamb uh, really, um, set the gold standard for rabbis in terms of saying, this is your platform every week, your, your most significant platform of influence will come through the sermon. Not, not necessarily through long-term classes or other things, the capacity that you can move someone in your sermon may actually shift their commitment to Judaism, their commitment to Jewish education, their own study. Uh, for those of you who have not seen the Koran Yortzeit Mahsar, um, I, I highly recommend it. It has uh, a number of Rabbi Lamb's most memorable Yortzeit uh, sermons. Uh, those that given directly before a Yortzeit, uh, you know, before on, on the Chagim, on, on Jewish holidays. And they're just so, so beautiful. And sometimes I'll have the experience of watching people who've recently lost someone reading a sermon of his and getting clarity on how they want to remember, forgive, or think about and reflect upon the person they lost. So what I want to do is I want to take you through aspects of the sermon. Can I share my screen? I see. I think I can. Let me see. Oh, it's not coming up in my email. Hmm. All right, I was going to share the sermon. I was going to share my. I was going to share parts of my article. So um, since it's not since it's not coming up, um, I'm going to just uh, share with you some parts of my article. Uh, in general, I like interactivity. I'm not used to speaking this much. So please feel free to unmute and ask questions or drop thoughts and ideas in the chat. 
So I want to just describe uh, or share how Rabbi Lamb's sermons have been described, which is the way that I open my article called The Emotional Range of Rabbi Lamb's Sermons, specifically on the five-volume collection from Magid Books called Drashot Lidorot. And, um, and they're beautiful. Now we're in Sefer Bamidbar, and I highly recommend those beautiful, beautiful um, uh, uh, sermons. They're short, they're to the point, and they really offer deep insights. Remember that Rabbi Lamb was not only a student of Talmud and, um, and Tanakh, Rabbi Lamb was also a student of Hasidic thought. So you'll, you'll meet Hasidic masters often on, his, uh, on, on these pages. So uh, his, his sermons have been described as passionate pulpit pedagogy filled with brilliant biblical insight and steadfast communal commitment on subjects as diverse and challenging as war, political upheaval, social unrest, and rapidly developing technology. Now, I will say um, this has been an interesting few weeks in the United States. As I mentioned, many of you know, the Supreme Court has had some very uh, challenging, um, uh, very challenging decisions to make and have made in the past few weeks. The overturning of Roe v. Wade being the most noted. I mean, you're talking about a banner headline in the New York Times, a banner headline in the Wall Street Journal today, um, last week, uh, a, 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 a ruling on guns. Um, these are polarizing times. We have the January 6th Capitol, uh, the hearings on the um, on the the takeover of the Capitol, and it's at times like these where I particularly miss the voice of Rabbi Lamb because he was not afraid to enter that fray and give people a spiritual way of thinking about it. There are many rabbis who are not that courageous, who will not take on subjects like that. They're afraid of the political polarization. And as a result, on, on issues of the day, on issues where we need a spiritual voice, they back down and they'll say something that's neutral and often not meaningful, doesn't, doesn't shift or challenge or help reframe the way people think. Um, as, as, a, as, a, as a student of Rabbi Jonathan Sachs is a blessed memory, um, I, 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 feel, I, I felt much the same way when I learned of his passing, which was uh, devastating for me as a student of his. He was my master's thesis advisor when he lived in, in England. I taught often in his shul. Lady Lane uh, studied, studied with me in, in a number of different contexts. And when he died, it was the same time that we learned uh, Motzei Shabbat that, um, the, the, that another historic presidential election, uh, which we had waited for that tally for a number of days had been determined. President Biden uh, now was in, uh, will be in office. And there was a sense of the rupture and the polarization of the country. I felt it today, I felt it then. And you really need figures who have the shoulders and have the gravitas and the intellectual and spiritual depth to come out and help us think about things. And I think that's where Rabbi, um, Rabbi Lamb did not back down. Rabbi Lamb, if anything, he really deeply uh, leaned in. And, and one of the things that I noticed in reading a lot of his sermons was that he spoke a lot about emotions which I also don't hear about in, uh, in a lot of different um, drashot, is their emphasis, you know, he talks about the primal terror, for example, in his sermon on Kohelet of one's mortality, he talks about joy and the, and the differences in, in happiness and joy. He talks about um, a, a gratitude and the importance of Hakkar HaTov in any number of sermons. Um, but I, I, I will share with you, and I, I want to read you a little piece of, um, a little piece of, I'll, I'll read a few, a few paragraphs, but again, please feel free to jump in, um, to debate, to share an experience or a story with Rab of Rabbi Lamb. I always enjoy those. Um, the emotional depth of Rabbi Lamb's writing became apparent to me many years ago while preparing a class for Tisha B'Av. I was reviewing the many types of tears, the verses in Eicha that mention crying. Do these references signal different types of tears, or did Yirmiyahu Jeremiah simply regard all of them as the same salty drops of despair. There must be more to this aspect of the human condition, so primal and painful. Who else might have written on crying? Just a few words in the search engine conjured a TypeScript sermon by Rabbi Lamb, replete with pencil marks and marginalia, where he substituted a word or corrected a typo. That day I received the gift not only of his thoughts, but also his iterative process. I read it with wonder. His diagnosis was profound and moving, 
challenging and demanding, a masterclass in sophisticated exegesis that expressed serious fidelity to the textual tradition with a pedagogue's gift for finding modern relevance in ancient wisdom. While reading it, I heard Rabbi Lamb's distinctive high-pitched fatherly voice that, content, that contained love, gentle chastisement, and expectation. And this is what he wrote. This was a drasha, this was a Rosh Hashanah sermon. So you could imagine on a yurt site or on the high holidays or pre-Pesach, Rabbi Lamb brought, I mean, he always brought his A game, but he, he, he brought, he brought, um, I think that's where he understood that the emotional aspect of the sermon was particularly important. So he wrote there, ours is an age which has forgotten how to cry. Now, this is a sermon he gave on September 29th in 1962. And he, and he says, he recalls the time when every machser would be stained with tears, but sadly confessed that in his tenure in the rabbinate, the pages of the high holiday prayer book were instead, quote, so white and clean and cold. Now, something had happened from his youth, where he went to his own shul, and in his shul, the shul of his youth, he was used to sitting with people, and all of them cried. All of them were aware of um, the significance of the day, the dignity of the prayer service, um, the sense of being judged, the fragility and vulnerability of the human condition. And how could you not cry? But of course, in his tenure in the rabbinate, he did not see people cry. He saw what he says, the pages of the matzer untouched, right? You know how when you have those, those drops of wine on Haggadah? So every once in a while, you'll open up a matzer and it will have that you can tell, you know, there's been some, some leakage somewhere that's made some of the words a little bit blurred. So I, I want to read what he says there in that sermon. He says, we have embarrassed ourselves into silence. It has become a style of the times to restrain our tears on the theory that maybe that way the pain will go away, that by refusing to display genuine emotion, the agonizing facts of our lives will be altered. But we are nevertheless human beings. And so the unwept tears and unexpressed emotions and unarticulated cries well up within us and seek release. What insight the Kutzka Rebbe had when he said that when a man needs to cry and wants to cry, but cannot cry, that is the most heart-rending cry of all. In other words, what Rabbi Lamb was doing was diagnosing through the use of the Kutzka Rebbe, this problem, this modern day dilemma that people have lost the capacity to cry. It doesn't mean they don't feel the welling up and the need. It's that they work hard to suppress it and repress it. And what results is a spiritual life, a Jewish life that is spiritually arid. And that aridity was of great concern to him because he understood that you cannot, the great, the great scholar and intellectual that he was, that you can over-intellectualize your religion and it ceases to become a vibrant life force. And I believe that's one of the reasons that Hasidic thought had interested him in particular, because he saw their wellsprings of dveikut, of devotional, uh, of, of a devotional relationship to God, in the sense that you were bringing Hakadosh Baruch Hu into the dialogue all the time. So what he, what he does uh, is he looks at uh, Sisra, at the mother of Sisra who cries, and he looks at Hagar, and he talks about certain tears that, um, that are tears of resignation. So I just want to, you know, just to teach that text for a moment. If you recall, in Sefer Breshit, in the book of Genesis, in Kaf Aleph, um, in, in the chapter 21, uh, Hagar is sent out of, Hagar and Ishmael are sent out of Avraham and Sarah's house. They're sent out at the time when, um, when, Yish, when Yitzchak is weaned. Um, it's a complicated text. Avraham is distressed and vexed about this decision. Um, and, um, and, 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 and Hagar runs out of water. And she takes Yishmael, who is not a young man at the time, and puts him to the side. He's, 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 he's in essence dying of dehydration. She puts him to the side near a bush. And a malach, a, a, a messenger of God, an angel of God, appears to Hagar 
And uh, he says, Malach Hagar. Now, in contemporary Hebrew, that'd be quite an aggressive thing to say. It's not, how are you doing, Hagar? I'm so sorry, Hagar. That's, what are you doing, Hagar? God gave Hagar a promise that was equal to Avram's promise. And she was the only woman in Tanakh to get the promise that you will be the mother of nation of a nation. That's a huge promise. You will be the mother of a nation. Now, Avraham gets this blessing and he waits for so long to have, he struggles with infertility for so long. He has a child with Hagar, Yishmael, and that's insufficient. And then he banishes Yishmael. He has Yitzchak, and then he's told to bind Yitzchak. And throughout this whole, throughout the, the, this whole episode, this whole challenge, Avram stays steadfast and faithful. He's promised that he'll be the father of nation, that his children will be like the stars in the sky and the dust of the earth. And he does not question that. He assumes that he has to figure out how to make this so with God's help. Here's Hagar. And Hagar is willing to get, to get rid of this promise. And was, she's given the same promise and a child who is dying of, of normal means, right? A medical problem that can be easily resolved or relatively easily resolved, and she does nothing to save her child. And what the, what the Malach does is not that he places a well before her. If you recall the text, he opens Hagar's eyes, and there is a well there. Now, this to me, and this is not something that Rabbi Lamb says, um, but it's, it, it, it's something that I, I think about a lot when I'm teaching this text, and that is how often is a solution to a problem right in front of us but we failed to see it. it was, the well was not created. The well was revealed to a woman whose eyes were closed because she did not think of a solution. So what Rabbi Lamb says about Hagar's tears is she raises her voice and cries. It is the cry of desperation, a morbid fatalistic pessimism. Hers is a realism that leads to resignation. And these, he says, are certain type of tears. Tears that do more than bemoan our difficulties, encourage us to surrender to what is unacceptable, rob us of our free will and agency uh, to change a difficult situation. He would not have called this learned helplessness, learned helplessness, but I'm going to call it the tears of learned helplessness. We go, I say, I just can't do anything. There's nothing I can do. I'm resigned to not doing anything. And then Rabbi Lamb turns to Rachel and Rachel's tears in her hard and brief life. And he says, she refuses to submit. She refuses to adjust. She refuses to accept exile and destruction as the last word. Her cries, her tears, her protest to God are the characteristic of the Jew throughout all time. In other words, there are tears of resignation and there are tears of worthiness. They are not the tears, he writes, of vain sentiment and self-pity, but of powerful protest. They're a sign not of weakness, but of strength, not of resignation or frustration, but of determination. Now, when I read this, right, I told you, I was researching tears as I was going to speak about them on Tisha B'Av in a shir on Echa in a, in a class on the Book of Lamentations. And all of a sudden, Rabbi Lamb takes me into his emotional world, his understanding the different tiers in Tanakh represent different emotional stages and reactions. And he believed that there was a type of Jew, a tear, there were, there were Jewish tears. The Jewish tears are tears of protest, tears where we're frustrated and we ask or demand something of God because we expect something in a covenantal relationship. And if you are not showing up as you should, and we can cry about that, and we can protest, and we can raise our voices. And so he believed that there are tears that are fatalistic and tears that are actually catalytic. And those are the tears that he said, we must cry. And that's why we have to cry on Rosh Hashanah. Now, I wish I had heard this sermon. I wish I had been a member of the audience and thinking to myself how my own tefillah, my own prayer at that time, that Rosh Hashanah may have been deeply changed. There might've been an openness, a sort of crack in the heart that allows us to deeply feel what we're saying. How could, how could we not? And yet he gives us the license to look at the words anew and look at our lives anew and, and to actually take responsibility for the world and say, have a good cry. 
Have a gazunta cry on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur. And you know what? Then when the holiday is finished and the fast is over, go do something about it. Go and change the world. Go and fix the problem. Cry about it. Because if you don't cry about it, you're not going to deeply understand what's at stake. And I want to share... Uh, I want to share some tears that were very important for me this year. I had the great privilege at Yeshiva University of taking 28 students uh, with, uh, with me to Vienna to work with Ukrainian refugees for Purim. Um, and it was, it, was, it was heartbreaking and moving and painful and hopeful. And uh, we had we brought 500 costumes. I think we probably outfitted all of, uh, all of Vienna. Uh, the students raised um, the, the students raised one hundred and five thousand dollars. So to um, and and that gift was doubled so that we could feed the Viennese Jewish refugees that were there traveling through Vienna um, during Pesach, and um, and the students understood what it means to work with a child whose father is still in the Ukraine, with no possibility that you're going home soon, and you're not sure if Vienna is a stop or if you're gonna stay here for a few months or a few weeks or a few years, or you're not going back and whether or not your father is still alive. I mean, these were, these were really consequential issues. And um, I was walking home with a student on Friday night. We'd spent a week, we were leaving on Sunday morning. And on Friday night, as we were walking back from shul, she began to cry and she cried, you know, that sort of breathless tears where you can't just, you can't catch yourself and where you can't even make the words coherent. And uh, I was talking to her and she said, Dr. Brown, we're leaving and they're staying. That's, that's a very obvious thing that we're leaving and they're staying. But what she was doing when she was crying was she was indicating how much she understood in her own leadership, how much she understood the fate of this community and how accountable she has to be when she returns, because she can return and because they can't. And so to me, the, one could read those tears as fatalistic tears, right? The, the, the nihilistic tears, the Hagar tears, or one can read them as the Rachel tears, the tears of someone who understood, I have, I, I'm so pained by this. And the pain, the suffering of someone else has grabbed me and is not letting me go. And therefore I have to continue doing what I can do to support this, uh, to support this community. And um, I, I, I just wanna say, uh, hold on, I just wanna say, I actually, I, I actually can share, I wanna make sure that you have the link to, I'm gonna get the link to this sermon so that I, the, the, this article, so that I can post it for you um, in your chat. Um, so those who would like to access this can do so, hold on. Dr. Brown, we, we've sent out your article to everyone already. Oh, you sent it out? Oh, wonderful. Okay, yeah. sorry about that. No, sorry but about I actually wanted to jump in because I, you know, I was, uh, I'm deeply moved by this idea of Jewish tears um, and mm. you know, the expectation of, of, of how the Jewish people are meant to have in, in that emotional response. And if we think about yesterday's, or, you know, your today's, uh, the Parsha, uh, the punishment to the Jewish people uh, for, for those nihilistic tears is you know, uh, the wiping out of a generation and 40 years of wandering in the desert. We're not allowed to cry for nothing. Uh, if we cry no. for nothing, we'll, we'll be punished as such. We, we have, we, we cry for determination for moments um, of that, that matter. Yeah. And, and sometimes I just want to say, cause it's a beautiful insight and please call me Erica, unless you're my undergraduate student and, and I have to give you a grade. Um, so I, I, I think about this, you know, sometimes we don't take tears seriously enough. A child cries and we don't always understand what that child means when the child is crying. Um, and we think, oh, you'll be better. It'll be okay. And you have to imagine that you were an adult crying. You, took, you take adult tears seriously, but you have to take children's tears seriously and you have to help them express and understand what they're crying about. And that, that's, that was one of the things that I learned um, from reading this. I want to share an insight from the Rav. I would say this, um, uh, of the many things I've been deeply influenced by Rav Soloveitchik, I would say that this, um, this insight was one of the most significant. When Moshe, he, 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 in his reading of chapter uh, two of Exodus of the book of Shemot, 
if you know the whole first chapter, the whole the first chapter is about the decree, the the, the change of um, the change of, of of Pharaoh, the Pharaoh's decree, and his worry that the Jews would be a fifth column, and then and then then we go into chapter two, which is an early biography of Moshe, and right at the end, uh, there's two psukim that tell us that um, that Bnei Israel were crying, and that God heard their cries. Now the weird thing about this, the strange thing about this is. They were crying. Maybe they, I mean, they were they were suffering in chapter one. Why does God only hear them? There's a biography of Moshe, and God hears them only at the end of chapter two. And uh, when chapter two has very little to do with the Israelites, the focus is on Moshe's early biography. And so I had actually had the gift when I, I lived in Boston where I was doing my doctorate for six years, and they spent four of them in Rav Salvechik's shul. And Rev Salvechik was no longer uh, was no longer alive at the time, and uh, or he was excuse me he was alive but he was, he was quite ill so he was not uh, praying. But there was his shender, his lectern with his with the velvet cover on it and his name, and uh, his presence was very much felt there. And uh, one of the one of the older gentlemen uh, used to uh, he, rep, the rub used to give Motzei Shabbat shiurim um, open to the community. And this man had uh, saved hours and hours of his shiurim, and he gave me the tape with this insight, this question of the literary structure of the the decree against the Israelite boys, the early biography of Moshe, and then God only hearing at the end. Um, only hearing Israel, the Israelite tears at the end. So this is how Rav Salvechik understood. He said, when you're in a playground with a child and a child falls, falls off a slide, falls off a swing, the first thing a child does is looks around. If the mom or dad are, are paying attention, the child has a gusen to cry because you don't want to waste a fall without a cry, right? As you're getting attention. But if the parent is not looking or the parent might not be there for the moment, the child brushes himself off and he moves on. He becomes numb sometimes to his own pain and the articulation of that pain. And what Rav Salvechik says is that in chapter one, there is no crying, even though the Jews were suffering because there was no Moshia, there was no leader, there was no savior, no one who was going to redeem them from their situation. What is the point of crying? You absorb the slavery. You absorb the decree. You throw your child into the Nile because who is there to listen to your tears? He says, but once Moshe appears on the scene, when Moshe appears on the scene, then the people, that is, he said, that's the gift of the leader. The leader enables the sufferer to cry. And when a person suffers and cries, that cry is a cry for help. Someone else can help. If you don't cry and you absorb all your pain and you don't tell me I am hurting, Erica, I can't, I don't know that. I, I might guess that, but I don't know that. And I don't know specifically how I can help you. And the most, I, I, one of the most amazing insights um, from, this, from this understanding of Sefer Shemot and Moshe's role is that the greatness of a leader is that a leader moves people from silence to what Rav Salvechu calls a primitive, almost animalistic cry, to tefillah, to prayer, to advocacy, shalach et ami, right? Let my people go. And then to shira, right? These are all different speech acts. Silence to prayer, silence to a primal cry, to prayer, to advocacy, to song. This, this is a remarkable, this is a remarkable sweep. And so I think that uh, Rabbi Lamb is sort of putting a different spin on tears, but it's not, it's not different in terms of its meaning. You know, he's looking at different texts, but in a certain way, both of them are saying similar, similar things about the role that tears play and the role that the, the listener of the tears plays in helping a person articulate their most profound needs. So the next time we hear someone cry, um, a friend, a family member, a child, that thinking about the shift, the slight shift that says, I am focused on what your tears are. Help me understand their meaning. Help me understand how I am accountable to you as a result of this. What happens after the tears? Hagar was ready to 
to, to leave her son there and do nothing. You know, that was the state of affairs. And she was going to give up on the divine promise simply because she couldn't figure it out for the moment. She didn't say, I need help. I need water. I, I, and the water was right there in front of her. So I think, I think, um, I think Rabbi Lamb has done something quite, um, quite remarkable in helping us, um, helping us think through this shift. So I, I want to just, um, I want to end um, and then hear any of your questions or observations with, um, with, uh, with two observations that I wrote in my piece. And um, I, I reread Rabbi Lamb's sermon after he died, The Three Who Cried. And I had had some correspondence with Rabbi Lamb. And I understood the Torah Mada, I write, is not really the primary work of a Jewish university, although it provides an excellent foundation in both these arenas. It is also not the work of an individual struggling to figure out how do you integrate and make sense of two worlds, sometimes aligned, but often misaligned. It's not even satisfied by the many outstanding articles of Jewish thought given out my first week at Yeshiva University in a Xerox anthology then called the Torah Mahadur Reader. It is nourished and nurtured by the power and frequency of brilliant and moving sermons. Rabbis and educators who harness the Torah to help people live in the complicated contemporary world inspire their congregants to go beyond the mere intellectual cognition of events. They don't only analyze Torah texts, they empower people to feel their import and weight deep in their bones. You know what it's like when you hear a sermon and it's so good that at the end, there's a silence in the room. So because we're talking about tears, I'm gonna talk about two types of silence that I've discovered. One is polite silence. And polite silence is the kind of silence when you're listening to a bar mitzvah boy, can't really hear him that well, and you begin, like you're trying to hear what he has to say. And then because you can't hear him that well, or because it's not engaging, you cough, you sneeze, you take out a little sucking candy and you take off the wrapper and it's really irritating to other people. That's polite silence. But sometimes in a room, there is profound silence and no one needs to cough. And miraculously, no one sneezes. Everybody is in this trance. It's like this magical space. And when the person speaking finishes, that silence lingers for just a few minutes because you're just in that space. And it takes a moment to transition out of it. And that's what I think Rabbi Lamb understood about the power of the sermon. And in those sermons, the rabbis don't only analyze Torah texts. They empower people to feel this in their bones. They help listeners understand and experience a moment fully, spiritually, and profoundly. I was looking for wisdom in all the wrong places. The sermon is an art form and very possibly the most compelling way to communicate a lived and integrated Torah Umada worldview. And I, I think it's through the sermon that I understood Rabbi Lamb's true genius, his emotional sensitivity and his humanity. And I finally realized that Torah Umada can only su succeed ideologically if it can compel emotionally. And um, yeah, and I, I think that's what I, I learned from him was um, initially as a student, as an undergraduate student in his class, I was awed by the scholar. But as I aged and went through various life experiences and lost people that I loved um, and, and moved and thought about my career and my family, I began to understand the genius of Rabbi Lamb as a human being. Um, and that humanity came out in the sermon. Um, so I, I, I concluded with uh, my own experience as a community scholar in his synagogue, the Jewish Center. And Rabbi Lamb, I write, I write, was an esteemed and beloved congregant of the synagogue where he once served as its esteemed and beloved rabbi. And I was always grateful to see him. I wish him a Shabbat Shalom before he was whisked away in his wheelchair. His hearing was poor. And when on occasion he told me he enjoyed my remarks, I assumed he was just being polite. He seemed smaller in that chair. He was smaller, but still dignified, always dignified, and so large in my admiration. And sometimes I had to turn away in those moments so that he could not see my tears. Oh, getting all verklempt. Anyway, so that's what I want to share with you. And um, I share this not only as an observation about Rabbi Lamb and his contribution, but really as a challenge to the world of Jewish educators and the rabbinate to take the sermon seriously, to understand that if we 
can hear sermons that can combine um, the best of Torah with the challenge of spiritual living, with a new way of framing the experiences that we're having, the onslaught of news, the experiences that we're having, the great, um, the great and profound uh, movements of the day within a framing of meaning that is deeply relevant, that we will be changed through them in ways I think that um, study alone doesn't always accomplish. So um, anyway, that's that's the um, that's the challenge, and um, that's the gift and the challenge that he that he left us. I think I think that's our inheritance. That's our inheritance. Thank, thank you so much. And thank please, you. anyone who has questions, put them into the chat or unmute yourself. Um, but I want to just ask uh, the first question, which is. You, you opened up by saying that there are very few rabbis today who are willing um, to to take the moral stance and to, to speak about things. Um, there and and there are very few rabbis who are willing to open up and, and be emotional. And obviously, Rabbi Lyon himself was, you know, like I know him as like as someone on a pedestal, and you can't imagine him sort of being in the trenches. But the reality is, and we've learned this over the past uh, several weeks, is that he was in the trenches. He cared deeply, and he was. Um, really engaged with his congregants and with his Talmidim throughout his career. Um, in a time now where mental health issues are so high and people really need not just inspired leadership but authentic leadership, how do we, how do we push rabbis and scholars and teachers to, to open themselves up to, to show their insecurities and, and help lead people uh, to, a, to a stronger position? That is... Uh... That is an amazing question, a really, really important question. And you're not gonna like what I have to say. Right. But I'm gonna say it anyway. <laughs> um, rabbis today, I think are in large part afraid to speak because we as congregants have not given them that platform because we criticize rabbis incessantly. Um, they don't do something and we notice it and they get very little thanks. And I think it's not always safe for rabbis to express themselves. Um, you know, if a rabbi expresses a political opinion, that could be itself um, dangerous and it could be alienating. And I recognize that. And sometimes because of that, um, rabbis are, you know, rabbis, um, and I will, will include educators because there are many, um, you know, fine non-rabbis who give sermons, uh, men and women. Um, I think that there's a fear and I think that's because we're not good followers. And if we were better followers, I'll, I'll give you an example. I was teaching a class many years ago, a leadership class, and I, I asked everyone in the room to write to their rabbi. I said, write a handwritten note or an email to your rabbi, preferably handwritten, but thanking your rabbi for, um, you know, for his, of his or her guidance. You know, this was a, this was a, 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 a mixed group of uh, different, from different denominations. Only one person did the homework, which is my, my life as a teacher. Anyway, the person who did, who did the assignment, um, Bill, um, Bill said, Eric, I, I want to share, I want to share what I wrote. And I want to share what the rabbi uh, wrote me back. And, uh, and he said, and I, I want to say something as a preamble. I'm embarrassed that I never thought to write my rabbi a thank you note. My rabbi brisked my boys. He spoke at their bar mitzvahs. He was under the chuppah and he married them. He's taken our family through so many milestone events. And it never dawned on me to express my gratitude. And he shares what he what he wrote, the very beautiful in his email. And his rabbi, he said, my rabbi wrote me back instantly. And my rabbi said, I cannot tell you what it means to receive this. I'm going to save it. I get so few of I get so few emails like this. So if you were a congregant, if you were a rabbi in a in a synagogue, you know, with a congregation that perhaps was very quick to criticize, but not always quick to say, what you're doing well, um, you don't necessarily feel safe to express that vulnerability. Now, granted, it's a two-way street. It's a two-way street. I, I, I'll just give you, you know, when I, I uh, frequently speak in shuls, very common comment when I come down from the bima is that someone says, here's what you didn't say. Dr. Brown, here's what you didn't say, All right? So I'm just saying, I think, I think you either have to sort of transcend that and just, you know, be able to lean into the moment um, and I'm not, I'm not talking about false adoration. I'm just saying, I think we can make ourselves vulnerable in environments that feel safe for us. But if I feel, if I say this, maybe you're going to fire me or you're going to have a board meeting and you're going to censure me or you're, then, 
then it no longer becomes a place where a person in a leadership position feels that uh, he has the spiritual moral authority to um, to guide. So I don't know if you like that answer, Alan. I'm, I'm not oh, sure. I, I love it. And I think most of my children loves it as well, with everyone on Facebook and other places as well. But it's, but it's an important wake-up call. Um, and, and I think that, you know, as I said, you know, there is something about the rabbi themselves being being authentic and, and opening up. Um, but they can only do that if they feel there is a, a safe space in which to do that. Yeah. Now, you also have to understand that you cannot make people happy. You know, it says uh, about Mordechai, you know, Ratsui Lerovachav at the end of um, the book of Esther, that he was beloved to Rovachav, most of his, in the Talmud and Rashi says, Velo Lecholachav, and it was a not for everybody. You know, it was, you're not going to make everybody happy, and chances are you're not going to make anybody happy, but you may move people and you may help change their lives. Um, I, I actually just, uh, you know, to speak for the moment alone, if that's okay. Um, I think we have a huge challenge right now, which is uh, which is bringing people back after COVID. I think that COVID has given people this sort of lingering permission not to show up, not to show up in shul, not to show up for minyan, not to show up for, for events. It's it's like the excuse of all excuses, and it and it worked for a while. But right now we have a job. It's not my job. It's not only job, it's all of our job to show up to come back, to be supportive. People need community. And, and some of the people, because you spoke about mental illness, which is an, an, an anxiety and health crises. Um, what happens when people feel isolated and we're not showing up to rebuild our communities? And that's on all of us. So I, I've heard a number of rabbis speak about this. I wrote about women not coming back um, for tradition. Uh, I'm happy, Ellen, if you want to, uh, if you just look that up, uh, Erica Brown, where are all the women just drop that in the chat. Uh, but I think it's true for, for men as well. I, I think we need to show up. I think this is a time where a lot of people have not heard a sermon in months. All right? And for some people, it's been years. So uh, I know that people are listening at home sometimes, um, sometimes they, but it's just not, not the same experience as being with people. And I'm not telling you if you have health concerns, you obviously have to, those, those, those come first. You know, we, we care deeply and profoundly about people's health, but sometimes, you know, we've, um, we've isolated ourselves to a point where we think, we think we don't need community and there's nothing we need more right now a hundred percent a hundred percent it's so so important um the, my, my next question and then I'm, i don't know if there's any in the room um you have no, no. um otherwise uh if we put it on the chat but my, my next question really comes down to a, a thing that you noted in your article which is rabbi lam um spoke often about the the changing nature of the drasha of the sermon um and how he felt that it was the, at the, the fault of the darshan, not the drash. Um, so that it was really uh, sort of rabbis had given up on, on the sermon, really because they felt that the shiur uh, was a far better way of actually connecting yeah. with their people. Um, I hear from colleagues all the time that they, they really don't like preparing for a drasha. I've got a colleague that wants to get rid of the drasha from his shul. Um, no, what do you think today of the, the, the place of the drasha? Um, and especially because a lot of people so love the yeah, so I think I think there are a few things. Number one, if you were giving a 20-minute um, drasha, no one needs it. You can say what you have to say in seven to 10 minutes, and it can be very powerful, and more people will come. And if you give a good drasha and you get the reputation of giving good sermons, people will flock to hear you. They, they need those 10 minutes. I will very often, I'm blessed to be in a shul um, in Ken Mill Synagogue with Rabbi Bram Weiberg, who is a master darshan. And I will, and in the pews, I will hear people saying when he finishes some of that profound silence. And I'll hear people say, I really needed to hear that. And so I, I, they're not going to say that after a shiur, right? And there are people who I think take the shiur approach because uh, you know, it's like an article. I can just tell you, it's harder to write a good short article than it is to write a good long article, right? It was, I have time to develop an idea, but that assumes that that when I'm giving a shiur, when I'm giving a full out textual analysis, that everyone in my synagogue is an intellectual or has that kind of textual capacity. And I will tell you that when you do that, you do not privilege many, many people in your audience who are not as learned, who sometimes children or adolescents, um, you know, sometimes uh, uh, men or women who don't have the textual skills, who feel like 
you're actually really interested in one segment of this community and not in all segments of the community. The rabbi, this is an important platform. The pla and this is where spiritual growth happens. Um, you know, I always tell people, I, I actually once had an experience where I, 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 um, I used to co-teach with a rabbi, an elder statesman who was a very important mentor for me. And uh, he once said to me, Erica, you never talk about yourself when you speak. And I said, uh, people don't come to hear me. And I don't have, you know, I'm like, I'm interested in ideas. And uh, he said, yeah, but ideas, people need you to wrap yourself in those ideas. And I took his, his feedback very seriously. And he said, you never tell anyone what to do. So why should I tell anyone what to do? Anyway, as it happens, I was teaching on the Wednesday before Y2K. I don't know if all of you were born then, but anyway, it was the year 2000. And everybody, I don't know if you remember, there was a tremor of nervousness, right? The whole world was going to shut down the internet. I mean, things were, like crazy things were going to happen in the world. And, um, and uh, so I gave a sermon, I gave a mashiur, a, a class um, on, on time and the way that Jews mark time. And uh, if you recall, Y2K, that New Year's Eve was on Saturday night, it was on Friday night. And so I did something that was very uncharacteristic. I actually said to people, you know, th this was not an audience of observant people. And I said, anyone who would like to come to my house for a Shabbat dinner, please contact me. I'd love to have you this Friday night. I said, and if you're going to go out and go to a New Year's Eve party, it's, it, you know, it's the year 2000, it's a new millennia, it's a huge event. I said, light Shabbat candles first. Now my face was beat red alone because it was like hard for me to say, you know, this is the way we, we mark time. And this is a beautiful meaning of ritual. And, and, and I'll explain to you why it's important for me. Anyway, as it happens, we did have guests from that class who came on Friday night. And a bunch of people had wrote, written to me and they said, you know, we decided we were going out, but we decided to light Friday night candles beforehand. And it's a beautiful ritual. And I don't know if they continue to do that. And I realized that I was backing off of the authority that came with teaching text. And it was my bad. You know, there's People needed to hear what this means to me. I wasn't only teaching a text, I was teaching my life. I was teaching the importance of the rituals that we observe. And it wasn't only a cognitive idea. The cognitive has to, it has to wrap itself around the emotion. And so I, I say that because I think that there are rabbis who are afraid to do that. They're afraid to stand up and say, here's an amazing idea in the Parsha. And this is how we might integrate it into the lives that we lead. But I think people need that. And I think there aren't enough spaces in our world for transformation and deep spiritual thought and remembrance of loss. And all those things really can be accomplished in an amazing sermon. Um, I'm going to call you Erica because you've told me a few times now, but I, uh, thank you so much. Um, it's such a beautiful way to go into our week thinking about um, just the need of, of thinking emotionally and speaking emotionally um both from the pulpit but also think for all of us in, in each of our in each of our lives and in each of our interactions when we bring that extra piece of emotion consciously um we can actually lift up every interaction that we have so i really want to thank you um for those incredible words of torah i've had like multiple messages just like oh my god she's so amazing um you know, people are trying to guess which rabbi doesn't like a drasha uh, like, like giving a drasha <laughs> Um, it's just, and it's really, it's nice for us to be able to gather, um, both in person, um, but also from around the world and to create this space and, and to learn from you. Um, I've been excited to have you teaching us for so long. I've wanted it for, for years. Um, and it's really, okay, it's on Zoom, but I'm so happy to have made it happen. Next time, maybe it'll be in person next time. That would be wonderful. Okay, um, I um, want can to- Can I go to sleep now, Alam? Can I go to sleep you, now? You can, thank you so much. <laughs> Um, I want to just end by thanking um, all of our speakers and especially to, um, to Rabbi Jeffrey um, Sachs, who has helped me uh, bring this series together. Um, it's been an incredible eight weeks um, and we look forward to what we can uh, collaborate on and bring to you in the future. So with that, uh, Shavuot Tov, Dr. Brown, thank you so much. Shavuot Tov, thanks so much thank for having me.